and we were talking about this um you know, but with the team we were we were talking about some different different topics that we hear people um you know discussing and experiencing a lot and kind of um how we select those some of it's my own work and things i'm reading or studying or my life or you know or consultation i'm involved in but here's one that we want to talk about today that we all all resonated with and it's this unresolvable unresolvable how do you do with that word unresolvable you know there are some conflicts that don't get resolved there are some situations that don't get resolved there are some disagreements that don't get resolved in fact the marriage research shows i was studying this uh, not too long ago that the happiest marriages are the ones that recognize that there are differences that the two people have that are unresolvable and they have learned to accept we're very different in these ways and we have unresolvable differences in other words we're not going to hop into a blender and kind of become you know a mixture of the two of us there are a lot of ways in which we do excuse me we do compromise and come each other's ways but there are sometimes there are things that are just you know they're going to be different and what the healthy marriages do is they accept those differences and they find two ways to work with them some of that is compromise but some of it is just acceptance and don't step on each other's toes in those areas but there are some things in life that are more painful than that maybe a conflict with the family that uh or a family member or a friend It's just unresolvable. Now, why would something be unresolvable? Well, let's start with the, let's uh, start to use a term, I don't know if it's exactly right, but, but truly unresolvable, okay? Because a lot of things are unresolvable, they're really resolvable. People are so damn stubborn or thick-headed or majoring on the minors, they could be resolved. Okay, you could give it up, flex, get over it, grow up. You know, there's some things that just don't matter and people make them unresolvable. But there are some things um, that are going to divide. Um, for example, how many martyrs, you know, we talk a lot um, here about faith. And when I study the history of the early believers in Jesus, and they were told, you know, deny him or you die. Well, that's an unresolvable difference. For them, that's just, it. it's not compromisable. It wasn't compromisable. Not going to give on that one. Okay? There are other things we can give on. In fact, in the scriptures, you see, you see people, even, even the apostle Paul, I'm going to get, for those of you who aren't into, into the faith, I'm going to bore you here. I'm going to, uh, just give me a moment here. But I, I love this example. Because a lot of a lot of Christians are so rigid and black and white that they can't even flex where you need to flex, and they judge each other, which is so not only stupid, it's forbidden in the scriptures that they're using to be black and white about. There are some things that are pretty clear, right? But some of them, like if you go to, there's a lot of places, you know, Colossians, Romans, other places. It says, look, there's disputable matters that not everybody agrees on, who even come from the same faith. Whether you drink or not, for example, which day you worship on, that one's okay. It says you do whatever you want to and don't judge somebody else that picks another day. Right? Or 
eating meat, sacrifice to idols. Now, that didn't happen in our local grocery stores very often, but back then. And for some people, this is such a big deal. I can't do that. Well, it says respect that difference and don't blow up a relationship. There's so many things that we don't have to blow up relationships over. But this started with the point that there are some things that, that we just can't move on. That's okay. That's okay. There's some things that um, this is where I choose to make my stand. Right? So that's going to happen, guys, in your life. That there are some disagreements that you're going to have to learn to accept each other with that non-compromisable disagreement. Now, hopefully you can do that and you can continue to love each other. Sometimes uncompromisable stances will separate you. And that is both psychologically sound, research, evidence-based is the new term they use for it. And also talked about in the Holy Scriptures that sometimes you do everything possible to make a relationship work or to get somebody to face a behavior. Like with an addict, I was, I was working last week on organizing an intervention where everybody affected by this person's behavior. So come together and strategically take a stand and say that we will no longer tolerate this and we want you we want to be in a relationship with you. But if you're going to stay in a relationship with us, you've got to be sober. And you've got to go to treatment. That person may choose not to do that. Well, that's not really resolvable at that moment because they have taken a stand for sobriety. And there are things like that that are going to be unresolvable because you should not give in on certain values. Sometimes that means the relationship is resolvable. You just agree to disagree. But sometimes it means that the relationship has at least a separation in it. Matthew 18, for example, talks about this. You go to the person, you talk about their heroin or their cocaine or whatever the behavior is that's causing them to, the words are, to hurt you, to sin against you. And if they don't listen, then you get two or three bad people, and then you get a bigger group, then you do an intervention. And finally, you say, well, then we can't be with you. How do you do the things that are unresolvable? See, if we can't let people go on their own choice of self-selecting out, if we can't handle that letting it go and say, well, I guess we won't be together for a while. And I've seen relationships, don't burn any bridges. You know, you can ask somebody to go up on the other side of the bridge, say, I'm going to go on the other side of the bridge. And there's a, there's a, there's a, what do you call those things? A river here between us i'm not walking over and i'm not letting you come on my side but you don't burn the bridge there's no such thing in the bible as a burned bridge there's always a way back one of my favorite verses in uh i think it's in first or second samuel describing god they say that he is a God that always devises a way for the banished person to come home. That's the God we serve. He'll invent ways. The biggest would be on the cross. See, when we banish people or people self-banish out, that's going to happen, people, sometimes. They don't want to. They don't want to be sober. They don't want to stop criminal behavior. They don't want to stop abusive behavior. And that's what boundaries have to prescribe sometimes. How do you do with that? Letting them walk. I remember when Jesus, um, he was pretty good at this. 
even though it hurt him. You know, he's described throughout the scriptures as it grieves him when people walk away. But he lets them. It's part of freedom. Letting people self-select out and not face their issues, not own them. But you, you heard this story told sometime. You think about this. There was this apparently really great guy called the rich young ruler. He was a person of apparently position, accomplishment, he was wealthy. He was a ruler of something, you know, the equivalent of a, a public company now. I don't know. And he comes to Jesus and he says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you've read all the rules. You know what to do. Come on. And he says, well, I've done them all. And Jesus said, yeah, well, there's still one thing you lack. And that was in his heart. Money was his God. He told him, well, then sell everything you got and give it to the poor. Love people over this idol in your life and follow me. Love God as God, not objects as God. And it said that that made him very sad and he walked away and Jesus let him go because he can't compromise on some things in order to have a relationship with somebody that's in denial of some reality. So how do you do? Can you get your head around that? Let's take this down to a micro level. That's the macro level. Let's take it down to the micro level. God, how many marriages would be so much better if in the morning before each of you is about to go to work or one of you is about to go to work or whatever, and you get in this disagreement or this spat, the healthy marriages say, all right, well, we'll have to come back to this. Let's make a time to talk about this because we got to come back to this. Why? Because it's not resolved. It is unresolved, but I'm going to be able to use healthy compartmentalization, which is a ego function, which is very, very important for us to compartmentalize stuff. It can also be very, very, very destructive because in trauma, things get compartmentalized and we lose access to them. And so then we become, have, you know, we have PTSD or depression or anxiety attacks when they try to reemerge, right? But what I'm talking about is healthy compartmentalization, which is a, actually an executive function of the brain, the ability to tend to what I got to tend to now and inhibit everything else. How much better if couples could leave something unresolved and continue to be nice to one another? All right, well, you know what? We're not going to resolve this right now. In fact, I don't know if we could because our emotions are too high. Let's take a time out. Let's just leave this unresolved. And let's talk about, you know, tomorrow we've got some time. And then they love each other the rest of the day. No cold shoulders. No freezing them out. No reminders every time they want to ask, you know, Where'd you put the Diet Coke? Oh, it's it's in that refrigerator that you're too cheap to buy a new one for because all you do is spend all your money. And so you can use anything for a reminder of an unresolved conflict, right? You can dig up dead bodies or, you know, whatever in the, where that we buried in the souls of this argument. I should say live bodies because it's still alive, sun or on. So what about healthy compartmentalization? Can you do that? What if you're a surgeon, a neurosurgeon, and you can't do that? <laughs> well, I don't want a neurosurgeon that's got any relationships because what if one of them upsets him on a call driving to the hospital? They can't leave it unresolved and compartmentalize it and carve out the right part of my brain. See, we've got to be able to leave things unresolved sometimes. And there's some people who just can't do it. They will hammer you till the cows come home because they can't let the cows be out there in the field and say, we'll get them tomorrow. 
they'll be fine. Or sometimes they're not fine. They're not coming on. We can't find them. That's unresolvable and let the cow go. See, we got to have the flexibility to deal with life that's not predictable and that's imperfect. And if we have cognitive rigidity or an inordinate need for closure at every moment of the day with every piece of lint that falls into our existence, then we will be unmanageable and unhappy. And sometimes you got to just let people go. As Paul said in Romans, I mean, I guess 13 or 15, he said, in as much as it depends on you, be at peace with everybody. But notice that phrase, in as much as it depends on you, meaning sometimes you can do everything you can do. And you're still not at peace. It's unresolved. So get comfortable with that, folks. And let me tell you one great way to get comfortable with it in as much as it depends on you. Put your arms around that phrase. No, I have done everything that I know to do. I've apologized. I've listened. I've given options. I've empathized. I've tried to understand. I've gone their way. Everything you can do, it will make it much easier to let it be unresolved if you're standing on the firm ground of having done everything that you can do. What else can you do? I don't know what else to do. That's great. That'll give you resilience against this. Number two, do everything that you can do in the context of community where you have people and you're asking them, is there anything more I can do here? And they're saying, no, you've done everything you can do. Then you're going to have a good place to stand. And you're not going to be second guessing yourself. You're not going to be bad. You're going to be sad. See, sadness is resolvable. Badness is very difficult to resolve. When you hadn't done anything wrong, but you're still bad. <laughs> Let's figure that one out. You didn't do anything wrong. I feel bad. Well, what am I going to do to make it right? Well, there's nothing. I didn't do anything wrong. Oh, I can give in. Well, then I can't do that. Okay, good luck. You're in prison. So get sad, not bad. Connect with others. Get feedback. Do the best you can. And let some things be unresolved. Paul did that with John Mark. Remember that? I think it was John Mark who had worked with him all this time. And then something happened and he said, don't bring him. I don't know. I, I can't be around him. He's not helpful to me or whatever. Well, then years later, in another letter, he says, oh, yeah, and, and make sure you bring Mark. He's of help to me. They worked it out, but it was unresolved for a while. We've all had that. We've all had that. 